Sikkim 365 and Baylor Plus have teamed up to bring Baylor fans the ultimate content bundle. You can sign up now for $17.99 a month, a $5 monthly savings, and get instant access to all premium content on both websites. For more information, visit either Sikkim365.com or BaylorPlus.com today. What's up, Baylor family? Welcome to another episode of Inside Baylor Sports, the official daily podcast of Baylor Athletics. Uh, Grace and I come to you after another Baylor victory, six in a row to end the 2024 football season. Uh, Baylor finishes at eight and four overall on the season, uh, six and three in Big 12 play. And we know after that rough start how unlikely this finish was. Uh, we knew at that time when they, when they only had the two wins coming off the Iowa State, that the schedule was going to lighten up quite a bit. And it did until the Kansas game. This was a game that was like, it kept trending up, kept trending up. Kansas started winning games. They had won uh, four or five games. The only loss was a two point loss to Kansas state. Bay uh, Baylor was the underdog in this game, even though it was a home game and Baylor had been playing so well, Kansas was favored. I think at kick, it was like two and a half, uh, two points, maybe one and a half somewhere. It was going up and down leading up until kickoff. Uh, but man, this was a game that just, I know Kansas put up a lot of yards, uh, and we're going to talk more and more about this game, but Baylor just controlled it. I mean, and honestly, uh, even my seven-year-old mentioned it, that this game, if they don't – if Kansas doesn't get that blatant flag picked up, uh, the blatant hold call on their first touchdown, that this was a game that Baylor controlled and Kansas was never really in. You take that play away, and they might have scored after it, but it was such a, it was such a, a weird call the way that it happened. But take that away, and Baylor controlled this game from start to finish. And honestly, to me, was the most impressive victory of this entire season. Even though Kansas was only four or, or five and seven to end the season, that was as good of a team that Baylor had faced all season. So I kind of view it like this. I, I still think that the most important performance of the season was the Texas Tech game uh, because I do think that's the game that you come off the bye week and it just turned their season around. Yeah. Right. From a lot of perspectives, like they ran the football. Sora Robertson had a super efficient day. The defense made plays like that game. They had to win to get to a point where they're at now. Yeah. And so I I always felt like that when we talked about after the bye week, you know, I mentioned if they win this game, there's a clear path to winning a bunch more games the rest of the year. But if they lost that game, it felt like they weren't going to a bowl game. So I find that game to be the most important one, but this was definitely the best performance. You know, when you take into account the team they were playing, um, what everyone was saying about them. I mean, let, yeah. let's be honest here. You know, I, I we have to talk about it. Everyone starts saying coming into this game that Kansas was the best team in the Big 12. And it was said by a lot of people, and it was very much a slight to, in my eyes, Arizona State, who is playing extremely well, and a slight to Baylor who'd won five games in a row, but that's what everyone was saying this week. And Baylor beat them by 28 points. And yeah. it was very much, it was all of that 28 points. Like this game yeah. was not competitive in the second half. Um, Baylor did whatever they wanted to do offensively. They're the only team uh, that's put up 600 yards on Kansas this year. Uh, in cool. fact, there's only been one other team that's put up 500 yards on them. Um, so Baylor, just what they did to Kansas in this game, Super uncommon to them all year. They'd been on a roll. They're beating all these ranked teams and they came into McLean Stadium and um, Baylor was just flat out the better team. Like you can't look at this game in any other way or you can't look at these two teams season yeah. in totality and come away saying Kansas was a better football team. You just can't. Not after this performance. Yeah, no, I I, I thought it was if you listen to the Dave Miranda post conference post game con press conference, he mentioned that they did a ton of stuff offensively that they weren't expecting. And you look at the statistical numbers of this game, and Kansas was really good on offense, but you could tell the way that they had some players just 
running wide open. And I know Baylor struggled defensively, but between the 20s, they did Jeff Grimes did a ton of stuff that they hadn't seen, and it allowed them to get to the red zone. Now, the difference was, was that once they got to the red zone, what they had done well all season was score the football in the red zone. Against Baylor, two of six trips to the red zones resulted in touchdowns. That was an, an incredible performance considering what Baylor had done all season versus what Kansas had done all season offensively. And that was the difference in the game. They went three three for six overall. That included a field goal. And then two, on, two of six uh, were touchdowns. And they scored 17 points. They had nothing else on the game. Um, and that was truly the difference. And, I mean, the, the missed field goal early because of the win, I think that I was being at the game, you know, I, I didn't see the – I knew that the wind was blowing, but I didn't realize it was that big of a deal. They mentioned on the on the uh, broadcast that the wind knocked that one down. That allowed, allowed Baylor to go down and score points first, uh, and then obviously the rest was history from there. But I was really just – I thought Baylor was going to give up points in this game. They gave up the yards, but Kansas truly never threatened outside of that first touchdown to me. Like they had the touchdown later in the first half uh, – or sorry, excuse me, the, in the third quarter – I and mean, that was with five minutes to go in third quarter. They only scored ten points through three and a half or two and a half quarters, and that in that last touchdown, it was thirty-five to ten at that point. Um, it was overall the best defensive performance by Baylor, regardless of the yards. They forced turnovers. They got third down stops. They got red zone stops. Um, obviously, they held them to field goal opportunities rather than touchdowns. I just left this game feeling like one that was the most impressive performance. But is that the springboard to, one, the bowl game, but then to 2025? Because that was the last thing that we needed to see because of what we know comes back on offense. What's the next step for the defense? And in that game, they absolutely showed their their potential, especially turning and ter forcing turnovers because that's something they haven't done all season. In the last two games, they forced a lot of them. So I we talked about this coming into the game. I fully expected Baylor to score in this football right. game. I yep. mean, against defenses like this, I bring it up every single week when they've played a defense that's rated outside the top 50 in the nation, they're averaging 41 points per game and they hit 45 in this game. And it could have been more than that, to be yeah. honest, you know, Baylor kind of oh, sat yeah. on the ball late. Um, but that's just what it was going into this game. Now, what I didn't expect was for the defense to do what they did. And I think that's what we're talking about here. And that's why it was so impressive because Kansas was moving the football. Sure. But when it mattered and when it counted, Baylor was getting stops and it felt like Baylor was in the right position a ton. Um, and not only that, they did what we talked about early in the week last week. They were going to force Jalen Daniels to beat them, especially in the second half. Um, you know, Devin Neal had some really nice runs, especially early on. Um, but they really shored that up in the second half and forced Jalen Daniels to make a bunch of throws. And he couldn't. He couldn't. He started turning the ball over. He looked like the quarterback that played early in the year. Um, and to me, that's a function of Baylor's defense because we haven't seen that Jalen Daniels in eight weeks. Yeah. And Baylor brought it out of him. And that is a credit to Dave Randa. That's a credit to the staff. They put him in uncomfortable situations. The scoreboard was uncomfortable, which made him have to press a little bit. And I think, you know, throw the ball into some situations that he probably shouldn't have thrown the ball into. Um, and it's really fascinating as well because Baylor got those red zone stops and because they were able to score and build a lead, you know, they forced him to press, which stinks for Kansas because truthfully, early in the game, he made a couple just awesome throws like throws, yeah really good throws even the throw that uh ended up not being a touchdown i mean that was you couldn't have thrown it better and the yeah. tight end just couldn't get his toe in bounds but um he looked awesome but once the scoreboard tilted uh it just was not in his favor and not in this offensive favor because they want to run the football and when you get down in a game it causes you to not be able to do that and if you are going to run it you have to make up for that by hitting explosive plays in the passing game which Baylor did a good job of not allowing aside from the ones where guys were just running wide open which did happen a few times yeah it, it was um you kind of mentioned the being in the right spot at the right time and I was watching that game happen and, and early they struggled I mean they gave up the play the big plays they had the uh I don't know how many plays it felt like they just Kansas had guys running wide open. Um, but then as they settled in, the offense got some points on the board. The one thing that I noticed was that the defense just seemed to be 
disciplined. And not that they haven't been, but it was like this was the moment that they put it all together of discipline was like they were in the gaps. They didn't over-pursue. That didn't negate the stuff that happened early in the game. And then the, the drive in the third quarter it was like three plays and immediately Kansas ran the trick play, got a guy wide open. Fortunately, he didn't score on the play, but they ultimately scored uh, later in the drive. But I just felt, man, this this defense looks rested. And then in the po- and then you start looking at the numbers, Kansas only ran 54 plays. They only had the ball for 22 minutes. Baylor possessed the ball for 30, almost 38 minutes in this game, where Baylor the entire season was like 23, 24 range every single game. They flipped that on Kansas, and that was something I wanted them to do in this game. I like run the football. You want explosives, get those explosives, but run the football. When you rush for 295 yards, you're 13 of 17 on third downs. That's a crazy stupid number. When you're running the ball that well, it helps. Uh, penalties were low. You forced turnovers. They just completely took Kansas out of their game plan. You mentioned it with De- uh, Jalen Daniels. His interceptions were bad. I mean, the, he had two of them. Um, he was forcing throws down the field, th- one to the end zone because they're trying to play catch up. Credit to Evan Bobby, too. Like, he's missed so many interceptions this year. The ball hits him in the hands. And like, you could tell his confidence was hurt from those. But the last two games, he's had some interceptions that, I mean, the interception he had in the back of the end zone was as impressive of, of an interception from a safety as you will see. The way he went up for that ball, uh, obviously playing underneath coverage on the guy on the back of the end zone. But in general, that defense looked rested, and it went back to the offense was possessing the ball. Those guys weren't tired. Um, you're not. You had you had a lot of long drives. You had a lot of time of possession jobs where those guys were getting rest. Where in a lot of these games where they're giving up late late points, they're giving up uh, late long drives. They're tired. They didn't have that in this game against Kansas. And I wanted to bring that up actually because six forty eight. The score is forty five seventeen. And it's fourth and one. This game's over. This game is absolutely wrapped up. No one cares on the Baylor side, right? No one cares. Like this game's over. Who who cares? Yeah. Uh, I guarantee you, Dave Randa cared in that huddle right before that fourth and one play, saying, "We're not giving up a touchdown here because again, it'd be another one of those garbage time touchdowns that has really." Uh, dipped Baylor's defensive numbers. We've talked about it a few times, but there have been a few games this year where they've been up big and they've given up a few garbage time touchdowns that impact your numbers. And on this play, I mean, Trevin Maai, holy cow. Yeah. I mean, shot yeah. out of a cannon. There was no hope. No, absolutely yeah. no hope for Devin Neal to get that first down. And honestly, to stop a running back like Devin Neal from getting one yard is... I didn't expect he, it in that moment no. at all. You don't see it at all. I I fully expected Kansas to score a touchdown on that drive. Full like full expectation. The final yeah. score is going to be 45 24 or whatever. Um, yeah. but he shot out like a cannon, just destroyed that play. Just absolutely destroyed that play. Yeah. And I think that that reaction by the guys who were on the field after that play was so telling of how important that was. Like that to get that stop play. and put yeah. that game away. And I, I just was so happy for them because. It does feel like every week, you know, aside from the Houston game, we've just consistently been talking about this offense and how the defense has kind of been, you know, holding them back in some regards or giving up explosive plays or, you know, yeah. this and that. And we've just been talking about how good the offense is and how Sora Robertson's putting up all these numbers and they're running the ball so well with Bryson Washington. It's like, yeah. you know, when you see moments like this, you have to give credit to the Baylor defense. And I will say in the totality of things for Baylor, um, this was complimentary football to the level that Dave Randall wants in this game. It's the first game that I think they've really matched what his expectation level is and truthfully what the expectation level has to be if you want to be a college football playoff contender and a Big 12 contender. Like You have to reach this level of performance probably half the games you play in a season if you want to actually be a contender and Baylor really has only done this once this year. And it was in this game, maybe the tech game as well. Uh, Those two games are the two that stand out, but imagine if they had done it four more times. I mean, we'd probably be looking at a team that is 10 and two or so. And in the big 12 championship game with a chance to go to the college football playoff. Yeah. You look at the Colorado game um, and obviously the BYU game In, in, in those games, you saw the flashes of, the potential. The second half of the BYU game, um, kind of this the middle of the game against Colorado, where they just shut down Colorado's offense. 
Um, and then they obviously scored the Hail Mary late, but like they hadn't seen the full game. And it's really kind of fitting, though. I would say you mentioned the tech game, the beginning of this streak, the tech game was their most complete game, but they gave up the garbage time 14 points in garbage time where that game was out of reach. Tech was going for it on fourth down, uh, trying to, you know, Baylor's like done with the game. Tech's still trying to score, uh, more credit to them for going and doing it, but the game was over. But then in this game, Kansas had every opportunity to do the same thing. The difference was Baylor controlled the game at the end of the game. They didn't let Kansas do that. And I, I'm sure there was there was a little bit different of a situation, too, with Kansas. It's kind of like our season's over now. Like We're not coming back. What else are we fighting for? Whereas Tech in that game was the middle of the season. There was still a lot to be played, and they were still fighting. But I, I was just very impressed with the defense. And I went you know, talking about Devin Bobby, but the, the play by Tevin Williams, the force, the fumble down the sideline where it was a busted yeah. coverage, um, haven't really looked at that play, what exactly happened. But for him to recover uh, or come and make a play, force the fumble, was massive. So there's those three turnovers. And then there was the fourth down stop that you mentioned. And I'm just basically counting fourth down stops. Teams go for fourth downs all the time now. It's just the new college football way. If you get a fourth down stop, that's a turnover. Like They should just go ahead and start putting that in the box. Like Those are big plays. Um, that's just as good as a turnover. You're just not physically taking the ball away. Baylor got one of those. So basically four turnovers forced. Baylor, I, you might have the number in front of you. Did they go for it on fourth down and not get it in that game? Did Baylor? Baylor, Baylor didn't even go for it because they were 13 of 17, 17 on third yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, so you're 13 of 17. Um, you have a field goal, a couple of field goal attempts in there. Um, but Baylor, so basically – no turnovers for Baylor, four for Kansas, and you win by 28 points. I mean, that's that's the name of the game there. Um, but defensively, overall, just impressed. And, and we can go back to the yards, and we can go back to the yards for play. You got, you expected Kansas to get that. You truly needed to play a bend but don't break defense. Um, they did that, but I would also say there was multiple times where I felt like Baylor, I don't know where the stretch was in the game. I haven't really highlighted it yet. But there was three or four drives in a row in the middle part of that game where Kansas offense did nothing. Like it was like a uh, negative play on first down and they couldn't recover negative play on second down. And they couldn't recover. And that was, that's where they separated themselves in that game. And it might've been, it only might've been two drives or three drives, but at that juncture, you knew that game was over. Like the, there was no chance for Kansas to come back because Baylor separated itself. They got the stops and the offense responded. You mentioned complimentary football, exactly what that was. It absolutely was. So I, I think, the next area I want to go to is this rushing attack. Um, <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. I mean, I'm so thankful we got to talk to Mason Miller last week. And, you know, he was probably wow. holding back a little bit on, you know, his expectations for this game. And I I'm sure Dave Randa yeah. mentioned, like, they didn't, they didn't expect this. And I think we came into this game kind of talking about the possibility of Baylor really being able to run the football at a high level. Yeah. And they did that. They, I mean, they ran the ball and ran the ball and kept running the football. 49 carries for 295 yards, six yards per carry. Bryson Washington goes for 192 yards and two touchdowns. Dawson Pendergrass adds 104 yards on the ground. And uh, Pendergrass also had the 20-yard touchdown reception. So these running backs were phenomenal in this game. The offensive line, I mean, Campbell Barrington, unreal game like if pff grade i think it was above 90 like really? he just put together an elite perf like elite of the elite he may have one other game in his entire career where he's hit 90 uh, i think it was probably the utah game from last that's year hard that's school. very hard to do like that and yeah. 90 and 90 for a, in any offensive lineman is is incredibly hard and it showed i mean these guys it felt like every time after the play it was like him colton price um, Omar Ekbedian, Sidney Fugar, we're just laying on top of Kansas guys, like just pancaking guys left and right. I was, so, I was just, I, I was a little stunned at how easily Baylor ran the football. I thought they would run it, run at a high level, get to around that 200 yard mark, maybe be above that. Um, but 295, and that includes a few sacks for Sora Robertson. Really, it was yeah. like a 300 yard rushing performance. Yeah. Um, that, that was not something that I fully expected. And because they were able to do that, they controlled the tempo of the game, controlled the time of possession, kept Kansas off the field, and ultimately just completely wore down Kansas up front. They had no answers for it. Yeah, it was it, – they flipped the script on what Kansas had just done to Colorado. I mean, they had 40 minutes of time of possession that game, and they went to 22 
in one week. And that, I mean, that truthfully, like you watched that game against Colorado. If Colorado could have run the ball at all, that game would have mu- looked much different. They just didn't commit to running the ball. That's been that's been Colorado's fall, uh, flaw the entire season. And what the difference between Colorado and obviously they have a great quarterback, Shore Sanders, but in TCU is that TCU worked to figure out how to run the football when they couldn't. Colorado never did that. Obviously, they've won nine games. They had the potential still fighting for a Big 12 championship. But if they could have done that, they would have been that much better. Looking at that Kansas game, that's exactly how Kansas beat them. We're not going to let your offense stay on the field. We're just going to control the clock. It was impressive against Colorado's defense. They weren't able to do that against Baylor. I don't think Devin Neal was tired. He had an incredible performance in the first half against Baylor. I thought he might have been a little worn down in this game. He wasn't. Um, Baylor just did what they needed to do. They got off the field when they needed to. Uh, it was very, very impressive. Uh, you mentioned the grades, and I, I pulled these up because I wanted to look for myself. But Campbell Barrington, um, run blocking grade was 90.7. Uh, overall offense, 90.3. Uh, Omar Egbedian, uh 79 overall, but run blocking grade was an 86 um, on the offensive line. Colton Price, 77. Sidney Fugar, 75. But all four of those guys, Omar was a 79 overall grade. Colton Price, an 83. Sydney. Fugar at 80.7. Ryan Lingell was still a 70.3. Yeah. To have four guys basically 80 or above, I mean, that's like that's that doesn't happen on PFF. And I don't I don't think those grades are this like tell all of the entire game, but when you're graded that high across the board and then it reflects in the in what happened on the field, it's a really good indicator of how well that group played. Mason Miller absolutely has to be thrilled. Um, and, and truthfully, I want to go to Sydney uh, Fugar on that group, his pass blocking grade was at 84.4. Colton Price was at 84.8. I don't know if Sydney's ever had that high of a grade uh, in pass blocking. And I'm, I'm pulling it up now. Houston I don't was actually, so. Yeah, so actually Houston was an 80.1. He's actually been steadily going up. This is really interesting. Oklahoma State, 73. TCU, 75. West Virginia, 77. Houston, 80. Kansas peaked at 84. So yep. he's been playing consistently his best football uh, this was his second best offense performance. He actually graded out at 86 uh, against Oklahoma State, but that left tackle position that was such a big question mark, he's answered that. I mean, he he completely answered that, and it's shown up in the run game and obviously in the passing game. I think they're probably disappointed with the sacks they gave up earlier, but they got that cleaned really. I mean, they those two sacks happened on like two possessions, and they got it cleaned up really quick. Um, and that was some second level stuff that Kansas sent at them. So I was really impressed the way Baylor played on both sides of the ball, but I want to continue with offense because the rushing attack was incredible. Two rushers over a hundred yards. Bryson Washington hits 1000 on the season, which is just mind blowing considering he didn't play the first couple of games and the way that rushing attack was the entire game. I mean, the entire season for the first six games, but then also to have two receivers over 100 yards. So to put it in perspective, like two 100 yards rushers happening in the same games don't happen that often at Baylor. Uh, they do it in other places, but it's still really hard to do. Two 100-yard receivers in the same game, excluding anything that happens with the rush games, are very hard to do. Baylor had 100 yard, two 100-yard receivers, two 100-yard rushers, and a 300-yard passer. I don't know where I like. I don't know if that's ever been done at Baylor. Probably in the Browse era somewhere. Maybe there's a game against West Virginia where they scored 74 points or 70 points or whatever it was. But like, that's rare. That's rare air right there like that doesn't happen very often and hopefully Baylor can pull that from their almanacs to see how often that's actually happened it's pro- it's not more than a handful of times in the history of the program right it's got to be a situation where they played like shock Linwood and like see strong um I don't even know because I don't think you would have had it with Abram and Ebner especially the passing numbers I don't think they would have ever had two 100 yard receivers so yeah that's a good question I, I assume it did happen during the Browse era but that's just a guess uh, on my end. Either way, it's very, very impressive. Um, Sora was incredible again. I mean, 310 yards, four touchdowns, completed 23 of 31 passes. And, you know, early on, it felt like he was going to maybe have like two incompletions the whole game. And then he finally had a drive where he, you know, threw a couple that um, hit the turf and he didn't quite have his best showing. But I mean, once again, QBR wise, 88.6. And so it's just like, he has that that one little moment where he had five incompletions outside of that was just absolutely throwing it all over the place. They couldn't stop him at all. He's still not running the ball very much. Uh, looks like he's kind of limping a little bit. 
out there, but it hasn't impacted his throwing ability. And I felt like going into this game, you know, what they didn't do well against Houston, as far as attacking specific matchups, they did extremely well in this game. And those shots to Monterey Baldwin, uh, were incredible. And for him on senior night to come in and have seven for 119 yards and two touchdowns completely out of nowhere, like completely out of nowhere. I mean, for most of the year, it's been like one for 40 and a touchdown was like kind of the, the high games for him. But in this game, I mean, they just kept throwing him the football. They took three shots to him. Honestly, if Sawyer had made a better throw on the other one, it probably would have been three touchdowns for yeah. Monterey Baldwin. It was just a little underthrown. The other two were perfect throws from Sawyer. Monterey came down with them. I just was, I was so happy for him to see yeah. him have that performance. I've already talked about Sawyer. I just want to reiterate, he was absolutely incredible. He's completely changed Baylor's offense. We've talked about him a lot. Baylor gets him back next year he's going to have the opportunity to put together a truly elite and special season at Baylor. So I, I just want to throw that out there. And then I got to give a lot of props to another guy who will be back next year and Josh Cameron, um, who looked across the line and saw Melo Dotson, one of the best cornerbacks in the big 12 and just absolutely destroyed him for four quarters. It was not close, not competitive. And then, and then he catches one, breaks a tackle and, walks in staring yep. at him literally walks in yeah walks into the end zone and he finished with eight catches for 102 yards and a touchdown but that's not even the story it was like every big moment they were throwing him the football and he was coming down with a big play uh, so huge shout out to josh cameron he had an awesome performance uh, against a truly very good cornerback in kansas yeah i mean baylor's we talked about it before the game what kansas would do defensively when they face a team that was extremely balanced and, and there's been there's teams that can do both i don't think there's a team that can do both at the level that baylor does tcu can tcu and colorado can throw the ball with anybody they can't run the ball with anybody uh arizona state can run the ball with anybody kansas state for the most part this year they've struggled in a lot of different areas to lead to five and four they can run the ball pretty much with anybody with their group they can't throw the ball with anybody what Baylor does in Kansas, great example. They can they can run the ball with anybody, but when they really have to come down to throwing the football, they struggle. Or uh, if and generally speaking, Baylor kind of pick. I mean, truthfully, where you can't pick your poison. Like we, you got to play straight up in a lot of ways, or you're going to get burned. Jake Spavdal, massive credit uh, for what he has created, uh, the way that he uses utilizes tight ends to get involved in the run game, also in the pass game. Uh, but, man, like, Kansas didn't have a chance. I mean, you saw it immediately. It's like if Baylor gets seven yards, eight yards on their first carry of the game, you're like, okay, they're going to move the ball the entire game. Because now what does Kansas – Who? how does that defense react to what they're going to do running the football? Um, I was just – it was their best performance uh, in a lot of ways. 600 yards, I don't remember the last time 600 yards for any Baylor game, much less a game where they controlled the game. They win by 28 points and they put up 600 yards. You might see a 600-yard performance when the game's 48 to 45 type of deal. Uh, Baylor did it just because they're consistently moving the ball up and down the field. Um, every single drive they did it, it seemed like. And, uh, man, it was it was very impressive. You mentioned Monterey Baldwin immediately after the game, after the game, sent him multiple text messages like, how happy are you for that guy? Uh, Ashton Hawkins gets hurt early on. Monterey, I mean, truthfully, I don't want to say it's like a blessing in disguise or made that offense more explosive – but he exposed that Kansas defense as soon as he started getting those snaps. And you you want to say, oh, man, I wish you would have been able to do that the entire – that game was the perfect opportunity for him to take advantage, have one last final moment for this team. Um, and, and it's really what he's done his entire career, big explosive plays, show off his speed. Uh, but he caught the screen passes and would get 10 yards, seven, eight yards. He did a lot of those things. And his hands were very consistent in this game where he that's an area he struggled with. That's It's made it difficult to always be reliable for him. And he took advantage of every opportunity. And you like you just absolutely love seeing that for him, for a senior uh, in a receiver group where I don't want to say he was in, in, after, in an afterthought. He's had big moments this season, but to do it consistently in this game was really cool to see. It really was, and there there is something about when he gets the football and the explosiveness that he yeah. has down the field, and 
you kind of know that the route's coming. Like the the routes that he scored on are the routes that he's pretty much ran all year. It's that same route. It's basically just a one-on-one situation with the safety. And it's just like, yeah, he's going to run by them and he's going to be open down the field. And they exposed Kansas a lot. I mean, they were attacking their safeties, which was something I felt like was going to be important in this game. I didn't necessarily expect Josh Cameron to have the performance he did. I was truly impressed by that. Um, but having Monterey stretch the field like he did uh, was really tough, I think, for Kansas to overcome because then you had to deal with that threat the whole game. It opened up things for Baylor in the screen game as well to Monterey because you got guys playing off more because you're nervous that you're going to give up a big play again in the passing game. And uh, Baylor really attacked there. You stretch the, fo- the field vertically, you stretch it horizontally, and then there's tons of room up the middle to run the football. And, and Baylor yeah. kind of hit them in all the angles. And when you're able to do that, um, you got problems. And Kansas had a lot of problems in this game from a defensive standpoint. And that's kind of why we came into this game thinking Baylor could absolutely win this game because I think Kansas's defense was getting a little too much credit for what they had done recently uh, when they hadn't really faced someone that could do the things that Baylor can do from a run the ball standpoint and also throw the ball standpoint. Like you mentioned, like having truly both. And honestly, I think if you look in the big 12, I'd probably say Baylor's a top three passing offense and a top three rushing offense. And there's no one else in the big 12 that, I think is even close to that. You know, you know, maybe if you dive in a little bit, maybe you could tell me that, you know, like a Arizona state, or maybe you could tell me a Texas tech, but I think that I just think that it's Baylor is, a, is better than, than yeah. both of them in certain regards. Like Arizona state has to run the football to be effective. Baylor doesn't, doesn't even have to run the football. It, it's certainly a lot. Like if they do run the football, you're not stopping them. But I still think they can still move the football, even if they're not running it to the level that they want to, or if they're not passing it to the level that they want to. I'm not sure the other teams can really say that if they're missing one or the other. Yeah. I mean, you look at the games that they lost in Colorado, and I don't even go back to the Utah game because that was a whole nother world ago. But you, uh, Colorado, BYU, Iowa State, they couldn't run the football in those games. Yeah but they were still right in those games. If you give them this running game at that point in the season before it all flipped in those three specific games, and we can talk about the what ifs. It's just making a point like Baylor was still throwing the football really well in those games. They just hadn't put it together in the run game. You go back to those games and you say, Baylor's going to rush for 150 yards on BYU, 150 on Iowa State, which is more than realistic at this moment. They probably win those games. They rushed for 166 on Colorado. It was just with Sawyer, wasn't with the running back. So it was it. It's amazing the the path that this team took. You can't sit on one particular aspect of this offense, and that was the beauty of Jake Spavadol's offense coming in. And it truly goes back to the Browns air offense of he replicates what he does off of what Art did, and he. It's, I guess the most remarkable thing is he's done it in such a short amount of time, but it's also transfer uh, credit to the transfer portal that they utilize going back to last office. They identified and got the pieces that they need to do this, and it just took a little while for it to gel. Now you go into the bowl season and you go into 2025, and your, your baseline expectations are significantly different. And now living up to those expectations are, are, are another story, Uh, When teams are gunning for you every single week, knowing that your offense is going to be what it is, they're going to game plan for you in the offseason. But Baylor has that – there's a different – there's going to be a different mood going into next year based on what they have on returning that they didn't have this year. Um, And that's that's just as quickly as that happened. So impressive. Like, it's just – and it built – I mean, and truly, it really – a defensive-minded head coach shifting his gears and saying, okay – we're going to let our offense do what it does, and we're going to figure it out on defense. Might have been the the, the difference because Jake Spavadol could have come into this season, and Dave Aranda put the reins on him and said, "Whoa, like let's slow this down. We can't have ten two minute drives in this game. We need to have some six and seven minute drives. We need some of those going to need to be the first half. Who knows where this season goes if Dave Aranda does that? He did not do that, and he allowed his defense to figure it out through the entire season." Game 12 of the season, what happens? They figured it out quite a bit. I mean, and it comes down to getting third down stops. It comes down to getting turnovers because you're not going to stop all the offenses you face, especially when you're 
your counterpart on your on your own side of the ball is able to score and move as quickly as they do. Full credit to this coaching staff, and you can say Jake Spavadol was the reason for this season, but if if Dave Aranda isn't willing to let him do what he did, this season doesn't happen. Dave Aranda had to be lenient and allow him to run his offense, and he did that. And, I mean, also the other factors for Dave Aranda, I mean, he had to hire two different offensive line coaches, yeah. and Mason Miller has gotten it done in yeah. every sense of the word. I mean, you know, I think rightfully – they deserve some criticism early in the year. And I think a lot yeah. of people were skeptical about what the unit was going to look like. And we saw it through the first six games. They couldn't run the football. They were quarterbacks were getting hit a lot. And then that bye week came and they figured out the left tackle position and they allowed that group of five to really come together. And it's been so impressive to watch. They're going to return four of their starting five offensive linemen next year as well which yeah. is just, I mean, that, that's not heard of very often, and that usually leads to very good seasons when you return that much production. Yeah. You add that with you're also returning a quarterback, and your odds of being very good goes up drastically. And so um, I think there's a lot of optimism for that. I also just want to mention, you know, I truly think that Dave Aranda has gotten about the most that he could out of the talent that they have on defense. I think that there is a lot of room talent wise for the defense to take another step forward, whether that's bringing in new guys, whether that's developing younger guys who, you know, were highly rated recruits, whether that's going out to the transfer portal and finding more guys uh, to bring in. I, I just think there's a level that they need to get to in regards to that in order to take the step that Dave Randa wants them to get to consistently. Yeah. But I think for this group, for what they brought in, for what they have, I think they took a bigger step forward than people will admit and probably a bigger step forward than the numbers will say. Um, but I've been very impressed to see them grow throughout the year as well and play that complimentary style football next to an offense that's playing so well um, also. Um, and, you know, I do want to mention this before we – you know, wrap up talking. I think it's important to mention program direction and just kind of how much this means to a program like Baylor's eight and four. Baylor's won six straight games. Baylor's got a top 10 quarterback in the country coming back next year. Baylor returns a lot of pieces. Baylor's recruiting at a very high level. You put together an eight and four season. You look at some pieces that they're losing on this roster. There's a lot of playing time available uh, right. to put around to other really good players. And when you've built this kind of momentum and all we've heard is, you know, recruiting is going to take off when you start winning and they just they're won. Here. Yeah. They just won. They're, here. they're eight and four. They're going into the off season with tons of momentum, regardless of what happens in a bowl game. Obviously it'd be great to win that, but, doesn't really matter. Signing day is this week. Transfer portal is pretty much going to be not wrapped up, but you're going to have a great idea of kind of what you're a lot of the guys that you have before you even play in that bowl game. So for them yeah. to get to eight and four, ride this momentum, have the the pieces that they have returning to show like, hey, this is how you can contribute. Look at how good we're, we're planning on being next year. That's a big deal. And that doesn't mean everything comes together. But what it does mean is that there's momentum. And there's culture and there's something about this program that truly feels like it's just at the beginning of potentially becoming special again, like it was in 2021. And like we've seen in past years as well, they just need to start putting together some wins and, and they finally did that. And now it's just about, you know, how do you deal with success? You know, can you, can you deal with success and expectations going forward? That's to be determined, but this is a great starting point. Yeah, it is. And and I want to hit on this really quick. You said, I don't know if the numbers really reflect that. There are, there are about five categories for this defense. And I want to mention these, and I wanted to mention them earlier when we we're talking about the defense, but final Big 12 numbers. Better finish number two in the Big 12 in interceptions, which is remarkable considering how they struggle. Wow. Um, number four in third down defense. Number six in touchdown red zone percentage number five in sacks, and number four in tackles for loss. If you want to know what the DNA of what this defense was to end the year, those were havoc, creating interceptions, being consistent on third downs. They gave up a lot of fourth downs. I think there was games where they they allowed Texas Tech to get multiple fourth down conversions. That number shot up a little bit. That were number 12 in that. Red zone defense, 
drastically improved from a year ago. I don't. They were like really, really dating back to 2022. They were like 95 percent red zone scoring defense uh, for the 2022 season. And it's gone down the last few years. This year has been really good. Um, and then sacks and tackles for loss has shot up from last year. This team defensively, it reminds you a lot of those. 2014 2015s they they don't they're not as good as those teams defensively they don't have the overall talent but the dna is very similar if we're going to create plays we're going to get the ball back to our offense and let them go to work if we do those things we put all those together with our offense as it's working we're going to separate from you and that's what we've seen in the season they've only played one one possession game in the six game winning streak the average score is like 45 to 27 or something like they're winning these games by two plus touchdowns on average. That's incredible. Uh, and it's because the defense is able to get the ball back to their offense. Um, and then as far as building on a winning season, I think there's always that, that people are almost scared to like set those expectations, but Baylor needs to set those. Ex like this is a program that can do these things. Six games win streaks shouldn't be unexpected. Those should happen. Uh, it's tough to do those. That's half of a season winning six straight games. Sometimes that's difficult to do to string them six together in a row. That means you're probably winning 11 or 12 games in a season. Like there's very rare that you finish eight and six where you won six games in a row. Baylor did that. You have to set expectations for yourself. I think Dave Aranda should welcome high expectations. The players on this team should welcome high expectations. That bar should be set because if you're, if you're not setting those, what are your ultimate goals? Are your ultimate goals to go to a bowl game? No, this program should not be set on just going to a bowl game. Um, this offseason is big for defining what the next step is. Transfer portal, recruiting class. I mean, it's going to be a highly rated recruited class, which is happening Wednesday. Um, transfer portal should take – they sold a bunch of hope last year in the transfer portal, hit on a lot of guys, a lot of talented guys. They have more than hope to sell now. This is Dave Aranda's job to take it to the next level – and it's on him. I mean, just like getting out of the ditch from three and three and eight, now it's on him to take it to the next step. I think he can do it. Uh, it's not easy. Sustaining success is not easy, but I think he can do it. Yeah, and I mean, we'll see what happens on Wednesday. But if the class stays together, he's already handled success in recruiting um, yeah. because the the thing of it is, is they have not been recruiting at this level. And truthfully, you know, people can argue with me. I'm sure national people will as well. There are a bunch of guys who are also underrated in this class. Um, yeah. so it's even better than maybe the numbers will tell you, but, um, I think going forward, that's important, but I think it also speaks to the fact that you're recruiting well in high school. That typically means you're probably going to recruit pretty well in the transfer portal as well. And I fully expect Baylor to do that. Find some guys that really fit what they're trying to do again, you know, as we go through the off season, I think we'll be able to talk even more kind of about specific needs. I mean, you can kind of see them. There's a lot of glaring ones like wide receiver and, you know, defensive back. Like you're going to lose a lot of guys. There's more specific positions like Jack where you're losing a lot of guys there as well. The edge rusher position. So we'll be able to dive into that more as we progress. But I do think it's important to mention that, again, high school recruiting success speaks a lot, I think, to how you're going to perform in the transfer portal recruiting period as well, uh, which should leave a lot of optimism. And you add that with how Baylor's playing and what they can kind of pitch to various recruits. I think it's very important and something that I, I hope people don't underestimate because, you know, if you want to be a great program, sustain consistent success, you got to be able to recruit high school level and transfer portal nowadays. And, yeah, and so we'll and see if Baylor's able to do that. Yeah, jun throw junior college in there. Keaton Thomas, uh, yeah. massive junior college addition last year. Um, but, yeah, it's it's all there. It's all there for the taking, and especially in this conference where Baylor can recruit at a level that's at the top of the league. There's no excuses to not have as much talent or more than anybody uh, in the league. And with that, uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, we will have an episode on Bowl Outlook. Uh, for you to enjoy. And then on Wednesday, or later in the week, I should say, not necessarily on Wednesday, we're going to have a, a signing day recap of what the the talent that Baylor brought in from the recruiting class that we're finally able to officially talk about once Dave Aranda announces that class. It will be really cool to discuss uh, with Grayson to get his insights on that. Um, and make sure you hop on Sikkim365 right now. We're offering a special deal, $5 for two months of premium access. Um, you can find the link, create a new account, sign up, subscribe, read about it, see what all we have offered over there. Uh, we don't promote that too heavily on here, but if you're a Baylor fan, we would love to have you over on Sikkim 365. Um, any final thoughts, Grayson, uh, as we move into the signing day week and obviously transfer portal? 
I, I just really quick want to mention that uh, Craig Smoke and I are also going to be live on our Sikkim 365 YouTube channel uh, for National Signing Day. National Signing Day full show, uh, 8 to 10 in the morning. So bright and early, grab yourself a cup of coffee and come just listen to to everything that we're talking about. There'll be interviews with prospects. There'll be a lot of conversation. I, I wouldn't miss it. Like if you're a Baylor fan, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. And then, of course, Colt and I, you know, we'll recap it as well later in the week. Yeah, it should be a fun week, um, as it always is. It's moved up a lot. I mean, it used to yeah. be February that we're doing this. It used to be December like 16th that you're doing it, and now it's December whatever fourth. Fourth. Or, yeah, like it's 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 up. It's here, which I think is good. I think it's good for for college uh, coaches who just spend so much time and energy on high school kids to get those out of the way, get those done, get them signed and sealed and delivered. Because they don't need to drag out for two more weeks when most guys already know where they go. And right. we don't have that stress, Colt. Those last, those last, uh, the first two weeks in December where it's just this frenzy of just nice, man. craziness that we've seen for years. Yeah, we don't have to deal with that anymore because you can't really take official visits during the season as easily. Um, so oh, it's, eliminating it's those definitely helps. Yeah, but then it's portal. Then it's like a fast and furious yeah. to get December 10 9th. guys signed. Yeah, so uh, it's going to be a lot of a lot of fun weeks leading up until Christmas. So, all right, Baylor family, that's going to do it for this episode of Inside Baylor Sports. Thanks to each of you for listening. As always, uh, for Grayson Grunhafer, I'm Colt Barber. Have a great Monday and sick and bears.